Good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to the uh, Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, where uh, Arctic Research is connected since 1988, and you're certainly welcome to come a little bit forward if you like. I mean, you're welcome to sit in the very back if you want. <laughs> Um, my name is uh, Bob Rich, and I'm the Executive Director, and thank you so much for coming to our uh, 12th Arctic Research Seminar Series presentation in Washington, D.C., where we are delighted to welcome Mia Bennett today. ARCUS works to connect Arctic research across boundaries through communication, coordination, and collaboration, providing the essential infrastructure, uh, the intangible infrastructure required for research to advance. We're a uh, not-for-profit consortium of organizations and individuals working together in support of inquiry, discovery, and understanding in this important region and informing sound decision-making. This seminar series is designed to provide unique access to some of the leading Arctic researchers and leaders for federal officials, members of the D.C. policy community, and the broader public that are interested in the uh, changing Arctic. The ideas shared here represent the cutting edge of what we're learning and exploring up north, and also what it means for the U.S. and the rest of the world. For those of you in the room here, I'd encourage you to take a look at the ARCUS materials out on the table outside. Um, and afterwards, I'd be happy to discuss any questions you have and would love to hear how we best can help you to succeed in whatever you do having to do with the Arctic and research. If you're online, you can access that information in the Documents tab. Um, if you're in the room, you should have received a seminar evaluation form, and I would really like to ask you to please uh, fill that out um, and return it to the registration table at the conclusion of the seminar. This is the way that we can learn what you liked, what you didn't like, and hopefully continue to provide excellent seminars uh, long into the future. Um, for those of you online, um, as soon as we're done with the questions and answers at the end of Mia's presentation, uh, we will uh, have a, a seminar evaluation pop up on your screen. Please do take a couple of minutes to fill that out before you leave. Uh, we really do value the feedback and uh, the information on, uh, on how you thought it went. Um, we are on Twitter, so uh, you can use the uh, hashtag Arcus Webinar to discuss the event. That's Arcus Webinar. And uh, we're currently joined by more than 163 registered participants online from throughout the U.S. in 14 states and also from Australia, Canada, Chile, Iceland, Norway, Russia, and South Africa. And it looks like we got about uh, 20 people here in the room in D.C. For those of you on the webinar, my colleagues are available to answer any questions that you have about ARCUS or Arctic research, and most importantly, to forward to us here in DC any questions that you have for Mia. You'll have the opportunity to submit text questions by typing your questions into the questions pane of your attendee control panel. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll collect them and address them during the Q&A session at the end. Whether you're here or online, uh, we'd like to invite each of you to become an ARCUS member. Currently, all types of organizations are eligible to become ARCUS members, including academic institutions, government agencies, corporations, and indigenous organizations. Also, any individual who shares our enthusiasm for the importance of Arctic research can become an ARCUS member as well. I'd invite you to join us. Join us. Uh, you can join online at www. or if you're here in DC, uh, I can take your membership application on hard copy after this seminar. I'd like to acknowledge our partners in the seminar series, the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, which enables us to use this excellent meeting space. And thank you also to the uh, Polar Research Board of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine for their assistance with registration. And of course, I want to thank the National Science Foundation's Division of Polar Programs for major financial support to ARCUS and enabling this seminar series. Now, without any further ado, let me introduce our speaker. I first uh, heard of Mia Bennett through her interesting and provocative blog, Cryopolitics. She's a PhD candidate in the Department of Geography at UCLA. Her research looks at Arctic industrial development by merging fieldwork, policy analysis, and remote sensing. Currently, she focuses on transportation infrastructure in Canada's Northwest Territories and the Russian Far East. Mia received a Master's in Philosophy and Polar Studies from the University of Cambridge. She's traveled extensively in the Arctic, from the Greenland ice sheet to northeast Russia to Alaska, and speaks quite a few languages. She's also active with ARCUS partner organization, the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists, APEX, um, and it's been great to work with her in that capacity as well. Her title today is Development on Ice, 
Social and Economic Impacts of the Arctic Transportation Infrastructure. Please join me in welcoming Arcus DC Arctic Research Seminar Series speaker, Mia Bennett. Thank you for the introduction, Bob, and thank you all for coming. It's great to be here today and just adjust this a bit. All right. So as we all know, climate change is rapidly altering the Arctic environment. Perhaps one of the most salient examples of this is the, was the um, decrease of sea ice to a record low in 2007, which shattered all previous years. So this, along with other phenomena such as thawing, permafrost, rising sea levels, calving glaciers and the like, have led to pronouncements that the Arctic really needs saving. So this is a poster from Greenpeace that kind of embodies this narrative that the Arctic is at risk of disappearing and we need to do something about that. But on the other hand, there's also this competing narrative which suggests that climate change is actually leading to a whole host of new opportunities in the Arctic. So this headline references um, an estimate made by someone from Guggenheim Investment which um, kind of estimated that there was a trillion dollars worth of investments to be made in the Arctic largely in the way of infrastructure for um, resource extraction and transportation. So you have these two kind of ideas which are at odds in a way it might seem. Um, further to this point, this kind of paradox could be termed Arctic paradox. And to illustrate some of the kind of things that leaders are, are saying about these two narratives, we have um, at the Arctic Circle Conference in Iceland uh, um, a few months ago, which occurs every year, on the one hand you have former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon who talks about how when the Arctic suffers, the world feels the pain. So this idea that the Arctic has become a region of global importance due to the climatic shifts it's experiencing, which not only impacts the people living there, the four million residents or so, but also the world beyond the Arctic Circle. On the other hand, in the um, previous year at the conference, the former president of Iceland, um, Grimson, who has been a big spearhead of kind of the new Arctic boom and trying to create the region as an investment frontier really, spoke about how the Arctic is like discovering a new Africa. So this is almost a kind of colonial sentiment that informs a lot of the discourses that surround um, Arctic investment as, and the Arctic as a site of basically resource boom today. So you have these kind of two, um, two perspectives which might seem at odds. And in both, there's some sort of reality. So on the one hand, I, just, I showed how Arctic climate change is very much happening. But on the other hand, the Arctic is relatively undeveloped um, compared to the rest of the world. So we can see here using nightlight imagery, which um, is generated by NASA and NOAA. So it's a SWOMI day-night band imagery. We can see um, essentially the brightest, the Arctic is really generally pretty dark, but the brightest points of light are in northern Norway, which is one of the most urbanized parts of the Arctic, but most of the other lights are largely concentrated around sites of resource extraction, so in northwest Russia um, and also on Alaska's north slope where there's a lot of um, oil and gas activity. Now if we broaden out the picture, we can start to see the lights of North America, Asia, and Europe come into view. And if we fill it out even more, we can see how really a lot of these lights in the world, which are all correlated very much with centers of population and industry, um, these three markets start to come into perspective and it becomes a little bit clearer why officials, elites, um, statesmen in these three continents might seek to connect their markets using the shortcut of the Arctic Ocean as the ice retreats. So we have the northern sea route on the one hand connecting Europe and Asia and the Northwest Passage, which would cut across um, northern Canada. These kind of developments lead me to my three research questions, which are, first, what do we know about the history of development in the Arctic, and how has that informed the Arctic region into the <coughs> present day? I've been curious about, well, in the present world, how is Arctic development really unfolding? And third, what does all of this mean for the future? So I'm going to structure the rest of this talk kind of following these lines, so past, present, and future of Arctic development, largely through the lens of transportation infrastructure. Um, so just to kind of give a little bit of an overview of the history of Arctic development, I think this has taken place at different modes and at different scales as well, and I'll kind of try and highlight this. So I'm going to begin around 1600, so I think there's basically been about, I would argue, 500 or so years of Arctic extraction that's oriented towards um, southern markets. Um, obviously the Arctic has been inhabited for much longer and has, and has had its own networks of internal trade and activity, but this kind of more outward-oriented resource extraction really starts around 1600 or so. 
And for a good 300 odd years, I would say the Arctic was really characterized by um, plunder and profit by individuals, companies, states, and empires. Um, so you have, for instance, beginning in the 1600s, the Russian Empire, um, or the Russians going east across Siberia, eventually reaching Alaska in pursuit largely of furs at the time. Um, you have other activities such as um, whaling, which was conducted off of um, Greenland and Svalbard in the North Atlantic, which eventually made its way to the North Pacific over this long period as well. And you have other events um, such as individuals seeking to um, make their personal fortune with events such as the Klondike Gold Rush. So really um, there are many other events during this period, but we can kind of characterize these first several hundred years as such. In the 20th century, I think there was definitely a shift, and that was kind of um, especially beginning with World War II and then into the Cold War, really a push towards modernizing the Arctic, militarizing the Arctic, and a lot of this was done for the benefit of the nation, so kind of nation building through these efforts. And at the same time, you had this kind of colonial civilizing project um, done by countries such as um, Canada, the U.S., Russia, in, this, in an attempt to settle their indigenous peoples and bring them into kind of the wage economy, so to speak. And what you see in this photo is just, um, this is in Barrow, Alaska. Um, the horizon there is the dew line. So this, was, this is kind of emblematic of the push to militarize the Arctic at the time. So the dew line was constructed from Alaska through Canada to Greenland um, by the US and Canada as a sort of early warning um, system against Soviet missiles that people were worried might come across the north. Now, if we look into the present day, I think following the end of the Cold War, there's been, again, another shift in how Arctic development is um, being pursued and at what scales of governance this is happening and what economic scales as well. So I think what we're seeing is that um, we have this new term, of course, sustainable development. So there's an idea that environmental and economic issues can be reconciled at the same time. And also global and local interests can also be reconciled. So you have this, idea, you have this kind of phenomenon where um, many countries beyond the Arctic are interested in helping out with Arctic development rather than kind of seeing what they can get out of it. So it's framed in a very different way with development being posited as something that can help the people living in the Arctic rather than something that will harm them. And I think obviously this is um, an area for rich debate. But also the kind of environmental questions have certainly come to the fore with images of polar bears on um, you know, tiny icebergs kind of becoming uh, very very common in um, newspapers and the like. So to go into a little bit more detail in, into each of these three modes of Arctic development, um, I think this is just something to, to highlight the kind of pre-industrial characteristics of, of networks in the Arctic at this time. Um, so this is um, the pan, on, on the left as you can see, these green lines are basically um, digitized from pan Inuit um, records of pan Inuit trails. So the Inuit are the indigenous peoples, um, one of the indigenous peoples that inhabit northern Canada and um, parts of northern Alaska. And these are records, I think, from mostly the 19th century that have been digitized and also from uh, various oral records as well and put into this kind of um, map here. We can see that the um, North American Arctic was really very much an inhabited networked traffic place. So it's not this kind of remote, isolated, static region at all. Um, and interestingly, they very much use the ice to move about. And we can see this is in contrast to the ship voyages which were taking place in the 1700s or so. So what I've done here is um, online you can kind of look at this whole database of um, ship logs uh, that the Europeans have digitized from all these handwritten captain logs. And then I just um, was able to code them and pull out the various um, tracks by country. So we can see the Dutch were very keen to go up to Svalbard, um, north of Norway, in pursuit of whales, largely for um, oil, or whale oil, I should say. And meanwhile, the English were um, going more so to um, Newfoundland in, in search of cod. So we can really see water was here, what they traveled across, the sailors, and this was in contrast to the ice. So you actually see almost a divide here where um, the kind of materiality of the environment, so to speak, kind of shapes these networks that, are, that, ha that emerged. Um, okay, so moving a little bit forward in this period, we still see, even up to the 1900s, this idea that the development of the Arctic was really meant to benefit the outside, and there wasn't really a lot of um, shame in saying that. So this is just from a newspaper article I came across in the 1900s um, from a Seattle paper. 
and it says either Alaska will be open for development in the right way or Alaska will stay locked. Um, and they're talking mostly here about an Alaska railway that Seattle was trying to get funded. And interestingly, it says even the Guggenheims admit it. So we can think about some of the actors that have actually remained present in Arctic development um, throughout these different modes and times. Um, if you remember the first headline on the first slide about the trillion dollars worth of Arctic investment, that was by a Guggen, um, an employee of Guggenheim, so seeing this legacy of the firm in Arctic development. So this is um, the kind of front page of the Seattle Star and says, are you, with us to, are you with us on this great project? It's to help Seattle. So no real bones about it. This Alaska's development here was to benefit the people of the city um, all the way down in Washington. So it says, um, the greatest and most vital project it's ever launched for the upbuilding of the city. So I really doubt you'd see this kind of um, discussion about the Arctic today. It would be much more about the development of the Arctic as meant for building up Arctic peoples themselves. Um, and then to go a little bit, to dive a little bit more down into this um, period in the 20th century, which I think is really characterized by modernization, um, militarization, and nationalism, um, this is perhaps highlighted by um, a photo I took in the Russian Far East, where um, what the first hydropower plant built on permafrost was um, started to be constructed in the 70s, and it's now really an incredible piece of infrastructure, and it's functioning today. And, people from other parts of the Arctic come to see um, the types of technology and engineering that were put into this dam. But early, in the early days of its um, construction, you can see there was this um, nice mural of Lenin kind of parading in front of this dam, which very much symbolizes how the conquering of the Arctic environment was seen in a way as building up the nation itself. Um, moving towards the end of the Soviet Union, I think again we see the shift that I had mentioned, which was a shift from national sovereignty more towards global governance and how um, Arctic development is proceeding and who is seen as a legitimate stakeholder in kind of shaping the way the Arctic evolves. So in 1987, um, the, former, the premier of the Soviet Union said, let the North be the globe, let the Arctic become a zone of peace. And so the Arctic suddenly was seen as kind of a place for demilitarization, actually. And this led eventually to more recognition of the Arctic as a unified environmental space which eventually led to the creation of the Arctic Council, which some of you might be familiar with as kind of the leading intergovernmental organization in Arctic affairs. Now, the Arctic Council, I'm not really going to go into too much, but I think one interesting thing that's emerged from the Arctic Council is the Arctic Economic Council, which was established in 2015. So its goal is to establish strong market connections between the Arctic states. <laughs> so we see a shift not only from the Arctic as a unified environmental region, but one that um, many are trying to turn into a coherent and unified economic region, and that's largely through um, infrastructural investments in transportation and in resources. And we can see um, documents and guidelines emerging, such as this from the World Economic Forum, which talks about how investment in the Arctic should be done responsibly and with consultation of indigenous um, residents, northern residents, and the like. And so just to kind of cap this off, I think um, emphasizing how the Arctic has turned into something that's perceived as a global issue, it's not just one for people living in the Arctic, not just one even for Arctic states, but really one for all countries seemingly to have um, a stake in its future. This is just another image I took at um, the, this Arctic Circle conference, which is probably the biggest conference in Arctic development nowadays. And here we see um, Japan being introduced by the former Prime Minister of Greenland. Um, so thinking about these connections between Asian states and indigenous peoples here. And Japan is saying how it can contribute. So it's not how can it benefit itself, but how can it help out is kind of the, the lingo today. So just to talk ab about um, some of the actors involved in the 21st century development of the Arctic, it's much more complex than in the past. Um, we have Arctic states, of course, but also subnational governments, non-Arctic states. Um, probably you've heard a lot about China, for instance, but also Singapore, South Korea are heavily involved in various Arctic affairs. Um, we have corporations, environmental organizations, indigenous organizations, which I'll come back to, and intergovernmental organizations like the Arctic Council, but also other smaller, more regional ones like um, the Barents Euro Arctic Council, just to name one of many. Um, but I, I would argue that a lot of the, um, the problem that the Arctic is seen to face has kind of remained constant over this whole time period. Um, so even though we have kind of a different discourse surrounding development, 
and different actors, we kind of have this old problem, which is that um, transportation is really the problem of the Arctic, and that's really the reason why the Arctic hasn't been developed. And transportation, it's often said, hasn't been developed because of the, this kind of um, these immense environmental challenges that prevent railroads and bridges and freeways from being laid down. Um, now what's interesting, though, I think, is how transportation is often presented as a kind of technical solution to not only cohere the region economically, but also as something to um, deliver human development to the people living there. So we have um, discussions such as, um, or headlines such as this one from Ainskip, which is an Icelandic shipping company that recently began operations to Maine, so it's kind of expanding across the North Atlantic, um, talking about how connecting markets creates opportunities. So I would say um, not just in the Arctic but globally, this idea that um, connection is a good thing and that it is kind of, you know, connections and, and routes and these are kind of a metaphor f uh, or posit always seen as a positive metaphor when in fact they, connecting different places also has kind of different consequences which I'll try and highlight in the next section. So it brings both good and bad things and I think that kind of gets lost sometimes in this discussion. And also, it's a, on the other hand, these kind of long-distance connections that are arising in the Arctic often happen the ex, at the expense of shorter connections. So for instance, as um, the Northwest Passage opens up and you have markets in Asia, North America, and Europe connected, the loss of sea ice is really an issue for um, indigenous peoples in the Arctic who would have previously used that ice to move around. So moving to the second section here, how is Arctic development unfolding today? Um, so if we remember this nightlights image I showed at the beginning, not only can we use the nightlights to capture kind of one specific moment in time, but we can also use them to look at how lights have increased and decreased over um, different periods from, um, from daily to monthly to yearly scales. So here what I've done is basically just subtracted um, an image from 1993 at the beginning of this period for which the imagery is available from 2011, and we can see um, a little bit hard to make out, but in red are areas which have increased in light over this 20-odd period, which is usually correlated with increases in population or economic activity and the like. And blue areas are those that have declined in um, lights for reasons that are a little bit harder to estimate, but tend to reflect perhaps depopulation or disinvestment. Um, so in blue, these areas that have largely kind of declined, many of them are across um, the former Soviet Union where the state has withdrawn due to pressures for marketization and the fact that it's really not economically feasible to support so many settlements across the Russian Arctic. Um, and some of the, some mines in the former in, um, Russia's Arctic have closed as well. Meanwhile, in Russia, um, oil and gas is booming. Um, Iceland seems to be growing, and also um, the lights along Nor Norway's northern coast are growing, and then Alaska, this has grown as well. So just kind of we can highlight these changes using highlight imagery, which is quite interesting. Um, but I think to really get a good grasp on what these lights reflect and what changes in the Arctic kind of look like on the ground, we have to go into the field. And this is just an image of uh, an old diamond mine in um, Mirny City in Russia, and we can see the city just sitting on the edge of this massive um, diamond mine, which was mined until, I think, just a few years ago, and other diamond mines are very much active in the Sakha Republic, where this photo was taken. Um, but there's certainly been um, depopulation in very, around various mines, and we can just see how this kind of whole city erupted on, or emerged on the side of this mine in the 50s, I believe. Um, but thinking about this shift away kind of from minerals and more towards oil and gas in the um, Arctic offshore, just to kind of capture this um, kind of superlative level of development that's happening here, this is um, the world's largest FPSO. So it's a kind of infrastructure used for offshore oil and gas extraction. And this was shipped by the world's largest heavy transport vessel to the world's northernmost um, oil field, which is sitting off the coast of Norway and is operated by Italian company Eni. And interestingly, it was also manufactured in South Korea so again, we can see the role that Asian states are playing in kind of providing the know-how and the infrastructure for the Arctic's latest push into Arctic devel into development. And that's just the route it took. And interestingly, um, the vessel was so big that it couldn't go through the, um, the Northern Sea route, so it went all the way basically around um, the Cape of Good Hope. And to give another perspective on these connections that are arising between Asia and the Arctic, 
and kind of how the desire for a lot of these seemingly close to oil and gas resources is really shaping the transportation networks we see arising. Um, this is just a map I made of um, what voyages took place on along the northern sea route in 2013. So this is something that is still really pales in comparison to how much, um, say, how much cargo is transited, transits through the um, Suez Canal, for instance, or the Panama Canal even. But um, the numbers kind of fluctuate, but this year was a fairly good year, and we had a lot of hydrocarbons um, going from the western Russian Arctic to markets in East Asia. So a lot of the discussion of Arctic development has really focused on the offshore, on oil and gas and the like, but I think what I'm kind of curious about is what's happening on land. So kind of um, shifting gears here, the project that I've studied, or the type of project I've studied the most for my own um, PhD research concerns ice road replacement in Canada and in Russia. So ice roads are a really important uh, means of transportation in these two Arctic countries, which are the largest ones. Um, they're used to supply communities and mines which, might not ha which do not have other permanent year-round land-based connection to the rest of the world. And what you see here is an ice road cutting across the very wide um, Liana River going out of Yakutsk. And this is just a truck that kind of makes this journey and it's you know, pretty safe to drive on despite what you might have seen on ice road truckers. Um, so one issue though with the kind of um, reliability of ice roads going into the future is that as temperatures rise, the seasons for ice roads become shortened and this is, um, this can cause need for flying in various goods and people and supplies, which comes at great cost to a lot of these remote communities in the Arctic. So one potential adaptation that's been um, floated is replacing various ice roads, perhaps the ones that are most in need or most in jeopardy from climate change, with permanent um, year-round roads. So this is something that's being done in the Northwest Territories in Canada where a new highway is being built from Inuvik, which is a town of about three, 4,000 people in the Northwest Territories, to um, Tuck, which is a shorthand name, um, which is a largely indigenous hamlet that sits on the coastline. Um, the other project I've also examined is just what you saw previously, this ice road in um, Yakutsk. Many people in this city uh, would like for a bridge to be built, which would um, be able to cross the Lena River year-round, and people would be able to transit um, to the other side where the Russian railroad and highway networks currently terminate year-round without concern for ice levels or water levels for their ferry and, and so on and so forth. Um, for the remainder of this section, I'm really just going to focus on the case in Canada. And in both instances, I've gone and done um, field work and spoken to a number of individuals, officials um, in both areas. So I'm happy to answer more questions about the Russian case afterwards if you're interested. But focusing on this Canadian case, so there are many other reasons besides climate change to build onshore um, infrastructure that's going to replace these ice roads. So it's not purely motivated by climatic concerns. Um, this highway, in fact, is the first public highway in North America that will reach the Arctic Ocean. So there is a, the, high, the Dalton Highway in Alaska, which some of you might be familiar with, but um, a, a public individual or a public citizen couldn't just drive up to the very end because of the oil installations at Dead Horse. So this is the first one we'll be, where you'll be able to go and dip your toe in the Arctic Ocean if you want to have a really long northern road trip. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just to give you some context where Inuvik and Tuck lie relative to Yellowknife, the capital of the NWT. And importantly, both of these communities are located within the Inuvialuit settlement region. Um, I'll come back to this, but this is essentially where um, the native Inuvialuit have settled a land claim with Canada and they have um, rights over this land for development, for use, so on. Um, so this road will really represent the end of the North American road network, which we see here. Um, and I think it's also important to note, just to kind of highlight here, how at risk a lot of these ice roads in Canada, so the, in yellow is where you see Canadian ice roads, um, how they're jeopardized by climate change. So last November when temperatures should be falling, when ice roads should be freezing up for um, beginning of use, which for the use which begins in say January typically, it was um, about 12 degrees warmer than usual Celsius in a lot of these areas. Um, the Inuvik Tuck Road didn't really face that issue as much as kind of some of the roads in more southern Canada, but it still is an issue, the shrinking ice road season nonetheless. And so we can also see that this highway 
it's, as I mentioned, it's not just motivated by climatic concerns. There's also kind of more geopolitical and questions of um, nationhood at, at stake here. So the highway is going to extend the Dempster Highway, which was a project associated with um, Canadian Prime Minister Ethan Baker in the 50s and 60s, being completed in the 70s, to really open up the Canadian North for development via the construction of this so-called road to resources. So now this road, which has been kind of, um, which was approved by Stephen Harper, and this will extend Kent, the Dempster Highway all the way up to the Arctic Ocean, where a lot of oil and gas resources certainly lie. It also connects importantly with the Northwest Passage. So as we'll see with this highway, there's been talk of maybe building a deep sea port at the end that could connect to this emerging um, maritime transportation network if the Northwest Passage ever really takes off. Um, even, even more so than the Northern Sea Route, the Northwest Passage really doesn't have that much traffic. Um, it's quite hard to navigate as you see here with the archipelago. Some of the waters are relatively shallow and you know, the, the headline voyage of Crystal Serenity, the luxury cruise vessel aside, there's not too much in the way of say cargo shipping or resource shipping going on. So I was just up um, a couple of weeks ago in the Northwest Territories where they were wrapping up construction for the winter. It's really the final big construction season because the highway is slated to open um, this October, November or so. And this is a gravel pit that you see here. So um, major gravel pits have been constructed in the landscape in order to extract the gravel out that they use to lay down the road across the tundra. So it's a 120 kilometer road, so relatively short. It's cost 300 million Canadian dollars, so that's probably like one dollar US, but no, I'm kidding. Um, it's about 200 or so million US, 200, yeah, and some change. It's taken about four to five years to construct. And it was funded um, in 2013, as I mentioned, by Stephen Harper, who was a major proponent of um, Canada having a type of muscular <coughs> presence in the Arctic and really um, pushing for Canada's Arctic sovereignty. So he, one could argue, was quite attracted to a project such as this, which would really leave his legacy in the Arctic. Now, even though the road's only 120 kilometers, so 80 odd miles, to give you some sense of what these landscapes look like across which um, the ice roads extend and across which they're building these permanent roads. You can see here um, this little black dot is a truck just blowing up here and this is um, a, a pingo which is kind of an ice cored hill. So really incredible landscapes across which they're deploying these new infrastructures to connect north to south. And this is an example of the ice road um, which has connected Inuvik and Tuk for gosh maybe at least 30 years or so. So this ice road will no longer be maintained once the permanent highway is opened. And as I mentioned, with the kind of, um, we have changes in connections and that also brings disconnections in other places. So the ice road will no longer be maintained and um, some people I spoke to expressed some kind of discontent about this um, because not only is it quite fun to drive on compared to a road, um, it's safer, it's wider than the narrow highway which has been built. It also leads to um, people's cabins along the road and people go here and collect um, logs and trees from the, or wood from the trees that sit along the side. So that will no longer be maintained once the highway opens. Um, to give a little bit of historical context for um, the road's construction, um, just briefly, so Tuktoyaktuk is this um, small indigenous settlement that I mentioned. Since um, the colonial period or kind of the period in which Canada was trying to really develop its north in the early 20th century or so, its economy has largely been developed, dependent on outside forces. So in the 1930s, there was a big push for whaling. Um, in the 1950s, that dew line, which you saw earlier, the photo of Barrow, one of those stations was constructed here, which a lot of um, indigenous, the Inuvialuit people were um, kind of wrapped up into constructing. And then in the 1970s and 80s, a lot of oil and gas development subsidized by the Canadian government um, took place right here. So you might hear about Arctic oil and gas as being something new, but actually it has a much longer history, um, which is, so it's not entirely driven by climate change also, the fact that oil and gas is being extracted up north. Now one thing to highlight is in 1984, which kind of has set the stage for the present um, state of development in this part of the world, was the Land Claims Agreement. So I won't go into too much detail, but the um, Western Arctic claims signed between the Inuvialuit and the Canadian state I think what's interesting about it is not only did it set up these corporations and um, set aside a, a pool of money for the new value to use for 
um, their own development. But it also has these economic objectives, which concern integrating the Inuvialuit into Canadian society by fostering economic self-reliance and a solid economic base. So here we don't really see um, integration into Canadian society based on some kind of shared political or cultural values, but rather on this idea of economic development. So we really see how important this has become for um, Indigenous participation in being part of Canada in a way. So to go a little bit into more detail with this highway, I think there's many different visions that surround what the road really means, and this is something that I've explored. Um, so on the one hand, the state kind of perceives this highway as this road to resources. So we have a return of kind of Steve, um, Prime Minister Diefenbaker's vision of a road to resources. So um, Harper here saying how this road will strengthen Canada's Arctic presence, but also again this idea that the road is somehow going to contribute to economic and social development in the north. Um, and we can see the highway from space kind of inching northward here. Um, so not only is it going to ostensibly contribute to social development, but it will also, of course, lead to the oil and gas leases offshore. So the Canadian government has leased um, a large number of areas for development. This is currently under moratorium, um, put, which was put in place by Trudeau not too long ago. Um, I would say that the many in the Inuvialuit corporate structure were really quite frustrated by this moratorium because they were saying, well, now you've built this road, but we can't really use it to, um, for oil companies. So there's a lot of tensions arising around the future usage of this road now. Um, at the territorial level, however, I think the vision is a little bit reversed. So whereas the state, the Canadian federal government sees this road as leading to the Arctic Ocean um, and being the end of the dumpster highway, um, various officials within the territorial government of the NWT see it more as the road that will lead to more roads going south, which will open up the NWT to minerals development on land. So they kind of have a different vision of what this highway will do for the territory's economy. Now, indigenous and local visions of development are very split. So I think in thinking about Arctic development, we have to always remember that not all indigenous people have one kind of shared mind as to how development should proceed. But um, one woman said to me that she had kind of had this view that the government was building the road and that it does what it wants and it pushes its way basically anywhere. But then she said something interesting, which I kind of wanted to follow up on, which was that the people with the money are the people that do something because money talks. And this is true not only in the Arctic, but of course in the whole world. So I thought, Maybe if I follow the money, not only where it came from, but who it went to, this could kind of shed some more light on, how, uh, on the inner workings of uh, development in this part of the Arctic. So um, I sat down with uh, people who are involved with the indigenous corporation, the indigenous companies, which won the contracts to build the road, importantly. And one person said to me how um, Inuvik and Tuk, these two communities, really rallied and went after the federal government. So they had actually wanted to build a road for 30 years um, because they wanted something to do. So ever since those oil companies left in the 70s and 80s, the economy has been pretty weak up here. So they talked about how they called it the road to resources when they were trying to market the plan to the government and how there's so much hooked to it. So we could argue potentially that these indigenous elites were really mobilizing the state vision for their own local benefit. Um, another person said, you know, he we talked about this road to the north and how it could be akin to what the railway was for the Canadian West, the one that went out to British Columbia. So once you're opening up the Arctic, obviously you're talking about sovereignty. So they really um, tried to speak to the concerns of Stephen Harper's administration in order to um, win that funding. And they went with a, one of the people told me that they went with a DVD and they went down to the Calgary Stampede, which was a big annual event for Stephen Harper and really spoke one-on-one -on -one with a lot of people in his government to try and convince them to put up the $150 million that the federal government eventually did for this highway. Um, so what this, what this highway is really seen as promoting is not only something for the federal and territorial government, but also something that will hopefully lead to cheaper groceries, cheaper supplies for the people living in Tuck with year-round connection. Um, so even though subsistence whaling, subsistence hunting is still very important, people rely on um, supplies like gas, supplies like boats and skidoos to be able to carry out those practices. So they're very much kind of um, relying on different technologies than they might have 100 years ago. People also um, 
you know, they don't just simply live off the land. They, they now rely on groceries, whether it's um, milk at $10 a gallon or cheese whiz that costs $20. So really incredibly expensive groceries up here that people very much hope will be lowered with the uh, development of a new road. So not just about oil and gas for the state, but about, you know, raise and brand for local kids. Um, and I think, interestingly, the road is also seen as providing some kind of life itself. So just in various conversations I had with people, um, one person mentioned Inuvik is dead. If it weren't for the road, there'd be a lot of desperate people. So the road has done a bit to employ a lot of um, locals um, in its construction, which I think is different from past rounds of our development where the state has brought up hordes of people from the south to carry out its vision. Um, in another conversation I, I had with people, um, one person, you know, I asked, well, what's going to come after this road is done? And they were joking about a road that might be built to another nearby community, which also only has an ice road. And he was completely aghast and said, no, I don't want that. It will ruin my land. But the other person from um, Inuvik said, well, I don't care. It fed my family for five years. So this idea of kind of more short-term um, concerns for their own livelihoods rather than longer-term multi-generational concerns over the land is some kind of interesting um, dilemma that a lot of people face here. And this is just a picture um, in Tuck. We see a lot of abandoned infrastructure from the previous oil boom, which just sits there kind of on the landscape. Um, so this is um, just an image of one of the contractors, Northwind, which is indigenous owned, that won um, one of the two contracts equal to $300 million to construct this road, employ local people, um, also, some people did come up from Yukon and BC to build the road, but a lot of local content and the employment to build this massive project. And as I mentioned, there's really this diversity in local views. So many, of course, are opposed to the road, and hunters and trappers in particular are quite concerned about the environmental impacts it will have on the land and how increased access, um, when people talk about, oh, there's going to be increased access to resources, they weren't so much talking about oil and gas, but rather the fishing lakes that they worry will get fished out by other Inuvialuit who might now drive up there to fish when they couldn't have as easily gotten there before. And then again, there's this question of what comes next. So will there be a deep sea port to connect with the Northwest Passage, or will this highway end up being the world's longest boat launch? So this is just the last bridge that they were putting in place um, about two weeks ago, and it's probably done now. But afterwards, there really aren't too many extra jobs left now that all the construction is pretty much finalized. And there's this concern very much that the road could end up becoming the world's longest boat launch because of this issue of climate change, which has really already been, um, which Tuck has already faced for many years now. So we can see how low-lying it really is. Um, shoreline erosion is a major issue, and you can see how close the road, um, various roads in town come to the um, Beaufort Sea around here. And, um, you know, I would just be walking around and someone would point out and say, a mile offshore there used to be a curling rink. So really dramatic changes happening within people's lifetimes here, which kind of begs the question of really how permanent this highway will be once it's complete. Um, so not only is there that issue of environmental change, which renders the road's longevity unpredictable, but also this idea of whether building these roads kind of lead to these short booms, but longer-term busts and long-term continual dependence on outside funds for economic development. And that's kind of a problem that the broader Arctic certainly faces. And just kind of to show the, the kind of what the aftermath of these booms, this is an oil rig left over from the um, early 80s that's just floated there for 30, 40 years and probably will never be cleaned up and it's something that um, local kids will go out to in their boats and play on. So a very bizarre landscape in many ways and you know, there's really probably no one tracking down the oil company to pay a fine for leaving this in the Beaufort Sea here. So I think um, some of the lessons from, an Arctic, from this Arctic Highway for Arctic development are one that, of course, locals always need to be consulted. Um, and this is something that seems very obvious but is often forgotten. Um, so this is a form of climate change adaptation here, different from um, an ice road, but really what's happened with the shoreline erosion someone in government decided to lay down these concrete blocks to try and stop that. But one issue now is that in winter, um, locals can't use their skidoos to go up on this part of the coastline because it could wreck the bottom of it if there's not enough snow. So people are really frustrated at this type of adaptation, which even though it seems well-intended, um, doesn't always have the right kind of um, consequences. Um, other things we can really kind of determine are one, 
local development needs seem to be more likely to be met if they're somehow um, mesh, if they somehow mesh with national or global imperatives. So even though local voices are much stronger in determining Arctic development now, they're still embedded within these wider um, global kind of forces. And I think locals here are very much skeptical of the um, idea that the road will bring some kind of greater development as much as Stephen Harper has said it will contribute to this um, big, big idea of social and economic well-being in the Arctic. It's kind of debatable. And also I think what's interesting to note is that indigenous land rights and corporations are not necessarily synonymous with um, environmental sustainability. So very much these um, agencies and actors can support the expansion of industry, of capital in the state. So I think it's something that we need to um, keep in mind is that just having local actors involved doesn't necessarily make it greener or more equitable, say. So um, just turning to the last section here now of what the future of Arctic development looks like. Um, of course, some of the future trends in Arctic development, one is that it's going to be warmer, it's going to be wetter. Ice is retreating. There are various studies done on when the sea ice will completely retreat in summertime for ships to be able to stay transit the North, North Pole. Um, there will still be ice in winter probably at least until the end of the century if the models are correct. But things are changing rapidly and that alters the um, predictability of putting in these major infrastructure projects in the Arctic at this time. So some of the engineers I spoke to involved with the roads construction said that they did kind of modeling studies for the next 30, 40 years out and that's how long they see the road as um, predictably lasting. But beyond that, it's unclear um, how the permafrost will really thaw. Um, geoeconomically, what we're probably facing in the Arctic is continued dependence on resource extraction and long distance transportation networks to bring those out. Um, another thing that I forgot to add to the slide here is probably tourism is certainly growing in the Arctic. Um, it's growing in places like Iceland massively over the past several years, uh, arguably to an unsustainable rate. Um, but in places like the Canadian Arctic, so even though many town officials here hope this road will kind of lead people to drive up to the Arctic, that's probably not really going to happen. In fact, along the Dempster Highway to Inuvik, um, I think the number of cars has dropped from 16,000 to 8,000 since the year 2000. So actually seeing a decrease in certain parts of the Arctic. So it's not like tourism will suddenly replace um, other industries, if any, that exist at the moment. Um, geopolitically, and this is what I'll turn to for the last little section here, um, as I mentioned, we kind of have this rise in the Arctic of global governance, but also local empowerment. And I think this is quite interesting to note through um, the cases of partnerships between Asian states and um, indigenous actors in the Arctic and also Arctic states. So we can kind of call this um, in the terminology might be global development. Um, so just to highlight two cases here before wrapping up. Uh, the first is Singapore. So we've heard a lot about China and the Arctic probably and kind of the scene is uh, with a little bit of suspicion, but Singapore is also playing a quite interesting role in Arctic development. And as a small state, it probably doesn't evoke as much suspicion. So Singapore happens to be the world's um, largest offshore oil rig builder, despite having no oil of its own has a major port, of course, and it's also very much interested in investing in infrastructure overseas. Um, so what Singapore has done uh, in terms of the Arctic is one interesting project is it has a sort of third country training program where it brings um, indigenous, indigenous students from permanent participants within the Arctic Council, um, which, are, which represent indigenous organizations, to Singapore to complete a master's degree in um, maritime shipping or maritime law. So they're really trying to kind of go beyond, uh, go beyond collaborating with states and really begin to work with the people and the indigenous corporations within the Arctic. Um, they have maybe other motivations as well besides trying to partner just with in indigenous peoples, which is simply um, the fact that if Arctic sea ice is really too go going to melt away, well, Singapore wants to be there because its own position as a sh global shipping hub could be threatened. So Singapore's also looked at potentially investing in an Arctic port with an Alaskan indigenous corporation in the Aleutians. So being quite innovative and long term in its thinking about how changes in the Arctic environment will affect the landscape for infrastructure, maritime infrastructure investment. There's also kind of this more pragmatic, perhaps in an almost distastefully pragmatic way, um, just one representative said to me in an interview, there's no point in saying the Arctic is a pristine area and no point in going there. 
um, we have to convince critics that we need to fulfill the economic needs of the whole world. So here in an interview, there's not really any casting made for helping the locals, but really to benefit Singapore and the world beyond. Um, and just the final case here, as I mentioned, I think it's important that we don't conflate um, local empowerment with being green and sustainable. Um, and one case to highlight this is the um, Ukbeagvik and Upiak Corporation, which is based in Barrow. Um, so this is a, um, one of the corporations that came out of the Alaska um, native settlement with the U.S. government in the 70s. So there's been a number of corporations that have grown that have billions of dollars in assets under management. And what you're seeing here is the explosion of, oh gosh, maybe 25,000 tons of TNT or something to open up a gravel pit. So gravel is used, um, it's very important, a commodity in the Arctic for a local scale for building kind of the foundations for homes and the like, and also for offshore um, oil and gas development. They need gravel to lie that down. Um, and then we were able to walk on the um, kind of remains of this exploded gravel site after. So really, of course, like a lot of damage has been done to the tundra here, but it's for the benefit of, local, of the local community. So we kind of have to weigh these two different um, two different sides of the coin together. Um, also, just an interesting thing to highlight is one might think that the people living right along the Arctic coastline might be the most convinced that global warming is something caused um, by humans, but that's not really the case according to this um, Yale survey. So this is the North Slope area, which is mostly indigenous peoples who still in many ways rely on activities like whaling, but they actually seem to have a lower than average um, belief in this anthropogenic climate change. And, just talking to people up here, they're very much um, pro-oil development because since the 70s, that's really where they've been able to make their money and now um, have like quite good facilities and infrastructure in the Arctic thanks to oil extraction. And um, just here to illustrate, so I think we often think of the Arctic as kind of being on the receiving end of development and really being impacted by development, but I think it's also important to kind of try and reverse that imagining and see Arctic development as going outward. So the same corporation, um, UIC, which I highlighted in previous slides, um, they, over the past nine years or so, have received almost half a billion dollars in government contracts, for, largely from the Department of Defense. Um, many of these contracts are for it to provide various services and logistics for the war efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan and beyond. So kind of very incredible going out from the Arctic by this company based in the town of Barrow. And, um, what we see here, all of the companies, UIC subsidiaries. So really just um, incredible kind of growing out, going out. And uh, one reason why the company has been able to get so many contracts is because as a minority indigenous owned corporation, it doesn't have to compete with other companies for a lot of these contracts. So thinking about how kind of the politics of um, indigenous land rights have actually led to this whole new landscape of government contracting is quite interesting and something I hope to explore in the future. Um, so just to sum up, to rethink the future of Arctic development, I think it's kind of important to look at a few key things, which are conventionally, we imagine Arctic development as being imposed from above. We also think of it as really being environmentally determined, so wholly shaped by changes in the Arctic environment. And we also think that there's kind of this debate of, um, or a question rather, of it being about development, a choice between development or conservation. But I think in kind of a new mode of thinking about Arctic development, we can really see now more than ever how it's locally negotiated, um, even locally um, kind of started from the get-go in many cases, as we saw maybe with this highway. Um, it's also very much socially produced, so while environmental shifts obviously play a huge role in, in kind of shaping Arctic infrastructure and Arctic development, at the end of the day it's humans who are deciding what does and does not get put in place. And finally, we can kind of see how development in some ways and arguably could help to save the Arctic if this is, you know, kind of a goal of anyone. I think a lot of people who live in the Arctic would say we don't need saving, but without development, whether it's locally or nationally or globally instantiated, um, because people are no longer wholly living off the land in much of the Arctic, without some kind of economy, there isn't going to be too much to do, as we saw with the case of the road, and this leads to a lot of desperation and various other issues. So I think we don't need to think of it so much as a contrast, but maybe look for ways in which um, these can be mutually integrated. Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge all of the individuals and um, funding agencies that have helped me along the way.
and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mia. So um, I have, we have time for some questions in the room or online. Please enter your questions in the chat box if you have them. Yeah, go ahead. I'll press the button on the microphone. Sure. Hi, I'm David Biet. Could you give a little more context to the numbers on the transport? I mean, there were thick lines, um, and you went by them quickly, but we're, ta we're not talking hundreds and thousands. We're talking like tens, right? Yes. Yeah, so for the, the map of um, the, north, the northern sea route in Russia, that was really only 30-odd ships that year, I think. Um, and more, bigger numbers for some years have been like 70, 75, but it's still nothing in comparison to the Suez Canal. And the Northwest Passage is like in single digits, if I at think, all, right? Um, it's harder to come by statistics, but for a few years ago, I found like 15 ships had transited the whole thing. So you have a lot of Ever. smaller vessels. Um, yeah. No, in one year. Okay. One year. But um, yeah, it's still pretty small numbers. So it can mean a lot for local communities to have one big ship come in, but in this global scheme of things, it's pretty paltry. And the Bering Strait in the winter is zero, right? Pretty much? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah, I wouldn't know, but sounds like it, yeah. So I have a question here from uh, Jasper Hardesty. It says, uh, um, externally driven development and significant changes to remote communities always come with social impacts which can be detrimental or beneficial. Are there examples of significant efforts to jointly plan between stakeholders uh, uh, long term uh, to guide cooperative and collaborative infrastructure and economic development? Hey, that's a great question. Um, I think with this highway, so there has been a, a big concerted effort by the local government to bring in local stakeholders, um, both indigenous and non-indigenous who live up there. So there's um, consultation meetings that are held, um, various planning meetings to see, um, sorry, just that little background noise, but various planning meetings that will try and figure out how can they kind of reduce the negative impacts that many foresee as coming with the road, largely increased drug and alcohol importation, and try and bring some kind of other activities instead. So I think there's been a lot of good work done with that road, but at the same time, a lot of hunters and trappers will say we weren't consulted enough, so that debate goes on. Other questions? Uh, so you've you've mentioned in a couple of your uh, your your different writings about this misconception that the Arctic is an uninhabited place um, that's sort of devoid of human activity or at least has been in the past. Um, uh, do you see this period in Arctic development in as sort of a do do you think this is going to reflect some of the different developments that have happened in the past? Um, the the resource extraction efforts that um, evolved around. Um, the Second World War or whaling or things like that. Is this is this period sort of a return to the Arctic, or is this going, or is the future of the Arctic going to be something completely different? Um, that's a great question. It's something that I think um, I've tried to wrap my head around. I think it is different in many ways from previous periods. So while it's still extractive based um, and largely extraction that's kind of unsustainable in many ways of fossil fuels and what and whatnot. I think there's a lot more local involvement and local revenue retention, especially in places where there have been land claims. Um, I don't really know if we were to shift and look at, say, Russia, if there, if it is, if there is that much local revenue retention. I think um, there's a lot of different global actors involved in, in Russia, from China to um, South Korea and whatnot, especially in the um, Yamal LNG area, which is being developed. Um, so I think it's materially different both in terms of the actors that are involved and in terms of how benefits are retained, but I still think there's a long way to go. I have a question about uh, um, the comparison between the uh, Dalton Highway and a little bit to the east, this new highway, and um, I'm wondering if uh, people looked at all at the ecological impacts of the uh, highway as it came in? Because this has been a huge issue with regard to the Dalton Highway. I mean, the dust that that highway throws up has caused enormous effects on both sides. Interesting. Um, so I don't know if they did too much comparative work between the um, ITH, Nibitak Highway, and the Dalton, but I think that there was um, some reference to the Dempster Highway, which comes up. and. Uh, I, don't, I haven't really looked at the environmental impact assessments too much, but I think people generally have this idea that, oh, well, the caribou herds adjusted and the land adjusted, so this road will be fine. But maybe it would be good to look more at what, say, this Dalton Highway has done. Yeah. And the other thing I would say about the Dalton Highway is that, you know, maybe, maybe people thought there would be a boom to tourism, but it hasn't been huge. Mm -hmm. 
certainly, and that's the same that can be said of the dumpsters. I mean, fewer and fewer RVs are really coming up every year because it takes so long to drive up. And so now a lot of people say, well, if we make it a loop and then have another highway coming down the Northwest Territories through the Mackenzie Valley, that will increase tourism. But I just don't know how many people want to spend a week driving in the north, unlike myself. So, so I have a question here from uh, Nicole Kaniarek. Uh, it says, with respect to uh, uh, Ukthayogvik gravel mining, uh, um, perhaps you should look at it as sustainability through a different lens. Um, locally sourced gravel, given the cost of shipping from another place, um, says a great description of the complexities of historic development and where development in the Arctic may be moving. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, is that um, it is sustainable, more economically sustainable, I suppose, and um, even though more of the externalities from that gravel mining are felt locally from this kind of uh, explosion in a way, then they don't have to spend as much money to import gravel from outside. So a really good point. appreciate that. Other questions in the room? Other questions? In the back, yeah. I had one question, which was, um, looking at the construction of the road, do you see other uses developing over time besides tourism? Um, so, yeah, I guess it would, this is really the million dollar question because some people just think it's a road to nowhere. Um, you have on a big scale, macroeconomic scale, the oil and gas and tourism are the two big things. But other than that, really just connecting Canada to the Arctic coastline with the road, I think sovereignty is kind of a big issue. And other uses will just be local, so people building new cabins along the highway, going out to fish, um, visiting friends and family between Inuvik and Tuck. So there's certainly a lot of um, local benefit, I think. But on the other hand, I met people who had never even driven on the ice road, so it's not like everyone's going to start going out and going on this highway. Can you say something about uh, oil and gas development? Uh, because certainly, you know, Alaska's Arctic development is entirely tied to the oil and gas development in Prudhoe Bay. Um, but in, in Canada, is there a push to develop that oil and gas? I mean, I understand there's the moratorium now, but are people still pushing for that? Um, I think right now it seems to be kind of at a standstill because even though there's the moratorium, without that being in place, the economics of oil and gas development in the Beaufort Sea in Canada would still be unfeasible, and people realize that there. So even though they're wishing for oil to come back, they're kind of, I mean, they know what the price of oil is in the world, and they know all, all about shale oil, it's, and they're realistic. So I think they're kind of just biding their time and hoping that 20 years down the line, it might be worth it. Maybe have a couple more. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Caitlin Antrim. Um, can you draw any insights or conclusions on the difference between um, the planning of land-based transportation in Canada with that in Russia? Um, that's a good question. So I guess I kind of look at more of the drivers and impacts, and I don't really know in terms so much about the planning, but I might say, you probably have a lot of insight into this, but I would say maybe in Russia there's actually more of a centralized way of thinking about how the Arctic will develop. So they, the Russian government has not numerous plans of how they foresee the Arctic turning out by 2020, by 2030, or whatnot. And in Canada, it's a little bit more haphazard. So suddenly the government found this money for the road, so it's going to happen. But there isn't really much of an idea of what comes next. So I think it's a little bit more logically planned out in Russia. Um, on the other hand, I think whereas in Canada, you have more local control and say over what projects happen. Um, in Russia, so this case with the uh, bridge over the um, Liana River in y Yakutsk, um, that bridge hasn't happened and really doesn't look set to happen anytime soon, despite the city of 300,000 people not having any year-round connection. And a lot of people told me, I mean, I'm not sure if it's true or not, but they had the money from the federal government for the bridge, but then that money got shifted to build a bridge to Crimea after the events in 2014. So there's this idea maybe that the federal government kind of controls more where the money goes for infrastructure and it's not so much local voices don't have so much of a say. But that maybe isn't necessarily the case and it could just be that Russia is in dire straits economically and there just was enough money for both projects and one was seen as more politically urgent. Um, so that's kind of the differences I might see there. So um, I got uh, one more question we should probably do here. How about, uh, this one's from Ollie Mitchell. It says, uh, have your studies given 
Have, you, have your studies given any attention to the secondary infrastructure needs that surround road development, such as communication, broadband, electricity? Uh, um, is that tied to the uh, transportation infrastructure, and are there connections that you're seeing? Um, so I don't really look too much at the secondary infrastructures that are rising, but it would be a really good thing to look at, um, in part because I don't think they're always tied to roads. So what's happening is um, in Alaska, there's a big um, subsea cable that's being put in coming from Japan, I think connecting to is it New York or London Stock Exchange. And that will deliver really fast internet and make a huge difference in the lives of many northerners in Alaska. And in Canada, you also have a broadband um, fiber optic coming up from the south to Inuvik. And these aren't really dependent on roads or ports being put in place, but just stock exchanges and various um, satellite companies wanting fiber optics so that they're willing to pay for that. So there are other certainly infrastructures that are worth looking at and that can have a material impact on people's lives without having too much of an in impact on the landscape. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And just to conclude then, um, I wanted to uh, thank Mia for a really provocative and interesting presentation and um, announce that we will be having our next uh, seminar on May 3rd featuring Dr. Robert Carell. Um, and that should be a very interesting discussion of uh, issues related to Arctic and uh, climate. Um, we also have all of the recordings from all of the seminars that are posted on our website. You can see the link up there. Um, the, uh, um, this current one will be up within, uh, say, a week or so. And um, again, one more time, I encourage you to become an Arcus member. Um, hope you uh, enjoyed the seminar. Thank you for coming. Please do fill out the evaluation forms. They're very important to us to be able to uh, continually approve this. And I look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thank you very much, and have a great day and a great weekend.